dear all, welcome. Uh, we'll be starting any minute now, just waiting for uh, our last keynote speaker to come online. So be patient for one second more, a few seconds, and uh, we'll start shortly. Okay. Should I start now? Yes, we'll start any minute. I'll, we'll announce you. Yes, let's start. Well, good morning and afternoon. Well, if we have any uh, people from the US calling in uh, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to our very first session of already the third edition of Connext uh, is disaster recovery. Uh, my name is Sophie Glerum and I'm from the University of Amsterdam. And my name is Andreas Krupa of the Cologne University of Applied Sciences. Um, we both will be hosting today's session. And uh, before you, we proceed uh, with our introduction, uh, we'll start with some basic rules of conduct. Uh, so please make sure your microphone and webcam are turned off, so not to disturb our presenters during our talk. And we encourage you all very much to ask questions and please do so in the chat box only. And we will pick them for our Q&A sessions. Um, for unknown, unknown technical reasons, <coughs> some of the slides may show up zoomed in. So if you think that's the case, um, please use the zoom function by the upper left corner of, your, of the slides. Um, and finally, and most important, uh, this is a conference uh, for and by emerging conservators, uh, most of them students, so please respect one another uh, for the exceptional effort for making this happen. And some of our, stu our speakers will be presenting a large audience for the very first time, so please keep that in mind. 
so welcome to this very first session of already the third edition, as I mentioned. Uh, for those who were not here the previous years, uh, a short introduction of how Connext came into being. Um, this is a joint effort uh, of the conservation training programs of the University of Antwerp, Amsterdam, Hildesheim, Cologne, Potsdam, Lincoln, Westin, Tomar. And this year we have some new partners joining in. Uh, the University of Dubrovnik, the Institut National du Patrimoine in Paris, and the École Nationale Supérieure des Arts Visuels de la Cambre in Brussels. Uh, all programs are within the field of wood and furniture conservation, with some programs having also incorporated polychromy and modern materials. And we even have some book-related presentations this edition. So you will encounter a wide variety of, of sub subjects throughout the different Connect sessions. Well, and our mission uh, as organizing team is to connect you, the students, and emerging conserv conservatory restorers with your international and to give you the opportunity to share your work. It starts with sharing your work, uh, new insights, experiences, and knowledge. And we hope you will continue doing so for the rest of your career, uh, for, of your studies and personal life. And we hope to lower the threshold for you to abstract, to submit, sub, submit abstracts for conferences like ICOMCC, Ebenist, and Future Talks. Let's connect and um, kickstart your national and international career and network this way. Well, we don't have a fixed theme when we send out our call for abstracts. We just assemble what abstracts we have uh, and group them together. And this year there was were quite some abstracts that fit into the very serious theme of disaster recovery. And because of this important and interesting subject, we have decided to give room to two keynote presentations. And the first of them will be Munir Bushenaki, a special advisor for UNESCO uh, on the field of cultural heritage. And uh, Mr. Bushenaki is a distinguished historian and archaeologist from Algeria with a PhD in archaeology and ancient history, who received the ICROM award in 2000 and the during his career, Mr. Bushinaki worked for the Algerian government, where he was responsible for the preparation of six Algerian nominations for world heritage. In 1982, he joined the Division of Cultural Heritage of UNESCO, where he coordinated campaigns. In 2006, Munir Bushinaki left UNESCO to become Director General of ICROM until 2011. And from 2012 onwards, he has, he has served as an advisor to the Director General of ICROM and to the Director National General of UNESCO. In a nutshell, Buchnaki's rich career makes him very well suited for opening this, this very first Connect session of 2023 uh, on disaster re recovery. I think we cannot hear you. Yes. You can, but I compile the right slide, but it's my apologies. Yes. Mr. Bushnaki, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Sophie. Good evening, uh, everybody from Amsterdam, but also from many other institutions I can see. I would like to start by thanking Professor Vincent Catersel and Professor Amélie Métivier for inviting me for this session today. And the topic I will present briefly is about the intentional destruction of cultural heritage in contemporary times. I will recall the fact that cultural heritage has unfortunately always been disfigured by successive wars in the world, 
But I, I would like also to point out that in recent decades, it has become a prime target of extremist and terrorist groups who at attack the cultural heritage. In addition to the sites devastated by military actions, it is also worth noting the significant increase in the illicit trafficking of work of art, as well as the intensification of clandestine excavations in a number of countries where an incredible wind of violence is blowing and which I present with some examples. At the end of the Second World War, the world discovers with astonishment the extent of disasters in different regions of the world with appalling figures for the numbers of victims, wounded and displaced, figures of such magnitude that the consciousness of the men of people have been shaken. As you well know, if there is one area where UNESCO has acquired its credentials with its advisory bodies, such as ICROM, ICOM, ICOMOS, IUCN, as well as with a number of NGOs and foundations that have developed during the second half of the 20th century, it is in the field of action in the preservation and enhancement of cultural heritage that UNESCO is well known. UNESCO has just celebrated its 75 anniversary in accordance with Article 1 of its constitution, which is still relevant and which is in connection with the title of the subject, cultural heritage and recent armed conflicts. In the constitution, it is said to UNESCO, its mission is to ensure the conservation and protection of the universal heritage of books, works of art, or other monuments of historical and or scientific interest, and to recommend to the people's concern international conventions to this effect. And this was written in 1945. A very famous Czech Swiss jurist called Jiri Toman wrote, war is the enemy of man. It is also the enemy of the best that man has produced, art, culture, monuments, or the entire historical and cultural heritage. The conflict that we see developing since the second half, half of the 20th century and at the beginning of this century, the 21st century, are more and more often aimed at symbols of culture in order to destroy, to destroy, and in some cases to destroy the memory and identity of the people. What we unfortunately see is that during these internal conflicts, not only the population is of course, one of the main victims, but also the cultural heritage of these populations that becomes a prime target for warring factions. These conflicts, and I will name them very quickly, the civil war in Lebanon between 70s and 90s, the long conflict in Cambodia between the 70s and the 90s, the long conflict in Afghanistan between the 80s and the beginning of 21st century, the breakup of Yugoslavia in the years 92-95, the wars and crises in Iraq since the 90s and until the recent attack of Daesh in the year 2014-2017, the interminable conflicts in Syria since 2011, the attack of the Islamist group on Saradin against Timbuktu in Mali in 2012, the attack on the Bardo Museum in Tunisia in 2015, the internal conflicts in Libya since 2011, the conflict in Yemen that unfortunately still lasts today, and since last year, the Russian war against Ukraine. So through uh, a number of slides, I will present to you very quickly what uh, this topic uh, has inspired me during my long career at UNESCO, at ICROM, and also since that time at the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage in Bahrain. And here I want to make a, a, a quotation from Archibald MacLeish, who wrote since, that since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace 
must be constructed. This was the work of UNESCO during uh, its uh, uh, long life now. Here, my first pictures show the museum, the National Museum of Kabul in beginning of 2002, uh, when uh, we organized a, a mission to see what the former regime of Taliban did for cultural heritage. And here I want you to see a leaflet on the uh, right side of the slide, which was written by Afghan themselves, uh, saying a nation type stays alive when each culture stays alive. I find it very, very emotional when we were in uh, Afghanistan for this first meeting of experts uh, discovering the disaster which happened in this country during years. Here you have the map of former Yugoslavia. And here also, as I said, the war was destroying, first of all, in history, recent history, the, the bombardments of the uh, Dubrovnik, the, the city, uh, beautiful city, which was on the world heritage list. And for the first time, uh, this city was, uh, was bombed. And this was marking the beginning of a conflict of more than four years uh, to, up to the break of uh, Yugoslavia. After the bombing of Dubrovnik, and you can see here the pictures of the monasteries and the buildings uh, in fire, uh, and, and also the restoration and the reconstruction after the, this period of war. And this is a picture of 1999. Uh, after this uh, uh, problem in uh, Dubrovnik, where all the, the news at that time were speaking about an attack against a World Heritage Site, which was something absolutely uh, non credible after that, unfortunately. Then we had the, uh, uh, the, the bombing in Sarajevo of the, uh, and, and the burning of the uh, li National Library of Sarajevo. And uh, in, a, in a more um, uh, visual manner, what was happening to the, the Bridge of Mostar? This is a picture before the destruction, and this is a picture after the destruction in 1993. And so we started at UNESCO and with the support of a number of countries, uh, the reconstruction and rehabilitation of the bridge of Mostar that you can see here uh, when it was completely uh, finished with the surrounding of the bridge in 2005. Uh, the reconstruction of the bridge, of course, as I said, was supervised by UNESCO. And then in 2005, it was the site of the bridge and its uh, surrounding was recognized as a World Heritage Site. We, we return a, a moment to Afghanistan uh, to show you in the, uh, in the map the, 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 the valley, which is called the Bamiyan Valley here in the, in the center of the picture. This Bamiyan Valley was subject to a terrible disaster. Uh, it was uh, these, there was two uh, statues, uh, very, very uh, large statues, one of 51 meters, the other one of 30 meters long. These statues were destroyed. They were bombed by the Taliban regime in March 2001. Uh, this was a, a real, iconoclasm and uh, this was also the beginning of the series of attacks uh, uh, again against cultural heritage that we will see this is a picture of the valley of bamiyan after the destruction and you can see the niche uh, the niche of the buddha which is totally empty now uh, we had a meeting with president karzai uh, here uh, and the Minister of Culture in the, in the right. And the discussion was about what to do now that uh, the, the Taliban regime is, is out, what to do about reconstruction or not of the Buddha of Bamiyan. This was the subject of the discussion. The next uh, uh, picture I want to show you is about Cambodia. Cambodia was also subject to the terrible war also a genocide. And uh, I, I went to uh, the, uh, the site of Angkor, 
uh, when it was still occupied and, and uh, having some Khmer Rouge present in the site. And we were able to see the, the situation of the temples. This is uh, one of the beautiful temples called, called Taprom Temple in the area of Angkor. And you see it is totally covered with the vegetation, totally abandoned. And also, we couldn't enter into the temple. You see uh, the sign here uh, in, indicating there were mines put by the Khmer Rouge, so we couldn't in, enter in the temple. Since 1992, after the peace agreement uh, it, it held in Paris uh, for uh, ending the war in uh, Cambodia, the site of Angkor was inscribed on the World Heritage List, and the Cambodians with international community started a long process of rehabilitation, restoration of major temples, but this is a work which is already uh, going on for 30 years, and the work is still uh, ahead. Uh, the two uh, major countries, Japan and France, uh, which are the uh, president of the International Coordination Committee for Angkor, they decided, uh, their two countries decided to go ahead with other countries and other foundations with the Cambodia uh, preservation and presentation of cultural heritage. Then I moved to, to Lebanon. Lebanon had also a terrible internal civil war. And when the peace agreement was signed in 1992, I uh, went to uh, Beirut in the capital. And this is the, uh, the situation of the, the National Museum that I saw at this moment, with only five uh, persons still uh, remaining to see what happens to the museum. No door, no windows, everything was, was destroyed, nearly everything, except some major uh, work of art, which were recovered by a box of concrete. And uh, after a long uh, time of work, uh, in uh, 1999, the uh, museum was rehabilitated and uh, uh, building is now open uh, to visit. Then we were faced with the long crisis in Iraq. And as you know, Iraq is uh, very well known for uh, a long history uh, and it's very important cultures uh, in, uh, in, this, in this country. So we went immediately after the, uh, the end of the regime of Saddam Hussein with the director of the British Museum, the director of the Massachusetts Institute of Art, the director of the Italy Iraq Iraq Center, Iraqi Center, and the chief of the Japanese Archaeological Mission in Iraq. And here you see, I was in front of the National Museum to see what happened to the museum during 8 and 9 of April. And here you see the shelves of the Museum of Iraq in, 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 uh, in Baghdad, where more than 15,000 objects were looted, and the American troops uh, started with uh, Colonel Bogdanas to make uh, uh, an evaluation about the objects uh, stolen and to start an, a new operation for the re possible return of the objects. Here you have a picture where you see Ambassador Cordone, who was nominated by the American authorities as Mayor of Culture temporarily, uh, saying hello to the director of archaeology in Iraq, Donny George, and behind him, the director general of antiquities, and of course, the Americans, after having not protected the museum, they were present all the time in the, inside the, the museum. And here you see a picture of the Minister of Culture of Iraq, when uh, finally one of the important uh, piece of art, which is called the Mask of Uruk, was uh, found and returned to the museum. Here, of course, you see a picture that I took uh, in Baghdad only two years ago when the museum was totally refurbished and restored with the support of Japan and Italy. Then we can see that, unfortunately, not only the museum in Baghdad was uh, damaged. Here you see the uh, picture of the National Library, totally burned, all the books, all the manuscripts. It was a disaster. And also here, another picture uh, totally, uh, you know, you cannot uh, support this kind of destruction uh, for, for no reason. We moved up to Tunisia, where uh, 
also in this country there was a, a movement of uh, you know uh, extremist groups they attacked the museum of bardo here you see a picture of the museum of bardo uh, with the tourists they tried to hide anywhere but unfortunately 15 of them were killed in 2015 inside the museum imagine the image that exists in the memory of the people uh, in Tunisia. And here the uh, criminal fire in a mausoleum in Tunisia, near the capital, in January uh, 2013. We move now to Egypt. Even Egypt was not, uh, uh, was also a target. And even in the middle of Cairo, uh, we have the uh, uh, very, very famous museum of Cairo. Uh, Egyptian uh, Egyptology for Egyptology, the room where uh, was uh, con conserved the uh, mask of Tutankhamun was uh, looted, and uh, 13 cases of display were, were uh, broken, and 70, 70 arti artifacts were looted here also with ICOM, with uh, in Interpol, and many. Uh, institutions who are trying to recuperate the objects of uh, of Egypt. Libya, Libya, uh, same. It's still in a very uh, unstable situation, and we see that in Libya, the group terrorists attacked uh, some uh, religious buildings. Uh, this is a, a Sufi shrine, but also, and this was very uh, incredible, they attacked in the far south of Libya in a site which is on the World Heritage List and which is called Tadrat Akakus. And they attacked the gra graving and uh, paint paintings of the Neolithic period, dating 8,000 years. Uh, why going so far to destroy this very, very important remain of the history of mankind? In, uh, in Mali in 2012, we were meeting uh, on, uh, at the World Heritage Committee, and we heard that in Tombuktu, Tombuktu is situation here in the map, Tombuktu was attacked by a group of terrorists, and they destroyed uh, uh, the shrines and the mausoleums, uh, which are in this city, which is one of the most important religious, but also cultural city of Mali. We moved to uh, Syria. Syria is still in a situation which is unstable. And in Syria, uh, we have seen damages which are incredible. First of all, in the uh, upper part of the, city, of the picture, the city of Aleppo, uh, totally destroyed. Uh, on the uh, right left, right uh, side on the picture, uh, we have the entrance of the citadel of Aleppo. The damages are enormous. And the, the picture with was shocking the, all the world is this picture of the Temple of Bel, uh, which was uh, destroyed by Daesh in 2015, because Daesh was occupying the city of, of uh, Palmyra, the, the, but also the Museum of Palmyra and the other picture with it, which is absolutely catastrophic is the Museum of Palmyra. This is how I have seen the museum when we were organized a visit by UNESCO in 2016. Now, Yemen. Yemen is also a country where an internal war is going on and there is a, a, a lot of disasters that we have we, we receive pictures and uh, information. Uh, these are pictures that are sent by our colleagues from Yemen, showing that unfortunately, even a site which is on the World Heritage List, like the, the city of Sana'a, is not uh, spared. And uh, there are attacks against this city, as well as against a very, very interesting uh, mud brick architecture, and also a very important citadel in the city of Taiz, which was the first capital of Yemen uh, during the, the 16th and 17th century. We come back to Iraq because after uh, the, uh, the end of the regime of Saddam, Daesh, this group of terrorists, was having a very important presence 
on this, on this, particularly in the north of Iraq, in this city that you see uh, the situation of, 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 of destruction. This is Mosul. Mosul is the second city after, after Baghdad. And Mosul was occupied during four years by Daesh. So they destroyed everything. When we went to, to Mosul, we, we, we find a city which was a ghost city. So uh, the decision was made by uh, UNESCO and by a number of countries to start restoring some symbolic monuments. This one is the oldest uh, mosque of uh, Mosul. It is called Mosque al Nuri. It, uh, it, has, uh, it was built in the 11th century and it was destroyed. And its minaret was a, a symbol of the city of Mosul. It was also destroyed. Uh, and uh, the churches are also uh, destroyed in, in, uh, in Mosul. So we started a program under the leadership of the director general of UNESCO, Mrs. Audrey Azoulay, uh, which, is, uh, which says, it is in the, uh, in the panel, faire revivre l'esprit de Mosul, revive the spirit of Mosul. And here we, you see the uh, father uh, Poquillon. Uh, he is the head of the Dominican in Mosul. He lives in Mosul, actually, and he is supervising uh, with the colleagues, architects ar and restorers uh, in, uh, from UNESCO, they are restoring this church, which was completely bombed and, and, uh, and totally damaged. So, uh, and the, muse the Museum of Mosul also is a museum that was bombed. Here you see the Assyrian room. There was, uh, uh, you know, a, a bomb inside the museum. And now the Musée du Louvre is working with the uh, authorities of Iraq. Now, there is no more Daesh, fortunately, and they are restoring piece by piece the work of arts which have been demolished inside the, the museum of Mosul. And the, the, the building itself is under restoration with the experts from the World Monuments Fund in New York. So this is very quickly because uh, I was given only 20 minutes to speak about, <laughs> I don't know, so many years of work uh, in the field. This is a picture showing Mrs. Azoulay, the Director General of UNESCO, with the Minister of Culture of Emirates and with the uh, Father Poquillon uh, and, the, and the Ambassador of Iraq to, to, far, to France uh, for the signature of this uh, important donation, uh, which is now uh, giving us the possibility to show uh, by the end of next year, 2024, the total restoration of two churches and one uh, symbolic mosque, but also the European community has provided some funds for the restoration of houses because the, the center of the city was totally destroyed and the people are living still under the tent, but slowly, slowly they are returning to their house. So this is what I wanted to uh, show you very quickly. And I return to the first slide because I, I consider that this is very symbolic what the uh, Afghani people were, have uh, written. A nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Mr. Bushenaki, for this impressive and at the same time shocking journey um, through different hotspots of destruction. Um, I think there will be some questions later in the Q&A session. Um, however, let's first turn to our second keynote. And um, yes, next slide we need. Disaster recovery is the headline of this evening, and this brings us to a lot of disastrous events of the last years. For instance, in some neighboring areas of Belgium and Germany, we witnessed on July the 14th of 2021, a big catastrophe, especially in the regions of the rivers Aar and Erft. Enormous rainstorms led to high water, which flooded landscapes and cities, thus destroying nature, houses, streets, and every kind of infrastructure. 
The public and politicians learned that the global warming and climate change, climatic change inevitably impacts our living environment and that obviously we are not prepared properly. Other disasters are man-made. The terrible war at Ukraine is going on and on. It creates incredible suffering and jeopardizes the living environment and not least the heritage of the people of Ukraine. From the neighborhood, we are all more or less spectators of this absurd and useless aggression and struck dumb with horror. We learn from the newspapers and other media that the destruction of cultural identity is one of the war objectives, like already mentioned by Mr. Bushinaki. Facing the growing challenges of environmental and man-made man disasters, new tasks rise for conservatory Soros. In many places, special agencies and task forces formed. The, the following key keynote divides in two parts. The first is about the so-called Notfallverbund of the city of Cologne, and the second part will guide us to cultural heritage of Ukraine during the war. It is an honor for me to introduce to you our next three speakers. Dr. Christiane Hofrath, uh, she is from the University of Cologne and she will introduce the work of the mentioned emergency agency of Cologne. Oh, there is a sound. <laughs> now it's gone. Um, she will be supported by Nadine Thiel from the Historical Archive of the City of Cologne. Good evening to both of you. After their report, they will pass the floor to Maria Borisenko, a conservator restorer from Dnipro, Ukraine. Unfortunately, we had no opportunity to talk with another before. However, I think she will provide a brief impression of the challenges of disaster recovery which emerged due to the terrible Russian aggression on Ukraine. Mrs. Thiel, Dr. Hofrath and Mrs. Borisenko, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. So thank you very much. And I, oh, I'm afraid there is. Uh, Seems that there are still some technical problems. Would it be maybe possible for Nadine Thiel to do the introduction? What do you think, Nadine? Okay. No, I think it's the same problem. We have a Hull effect. Um, how to cope with that? Shall we have a second try, Ms. Hofrath? Yes, I've changed the system, but it's, it's, it's quite the same problem with, with my docking station. I'm sorry for that. And I tried to, to manage this problem. So can you hear me now? This is yes, there is still a local, uh, effect. Okay. okay. So I put, I, um, I'm sorry, I, I missed now this, the introduction uh, that you made for me. And um, I will give you a few words to my person and to the Cologne Notfallverbund, if it's okay so, with sorry. this session. Sorry, Ms. Hofrat, to disturb, but uh, there is still uh, this repetition effect um, when you are uh, talking, when you are speaking. Maybe it's what we call a Rückkopplung in Germany, and um, maybe you have uh, some loudspeakers where you hear yourself 
when you speak. Uh, maybe you can switch off the loudspeakers and just um, talk to the microphone for the moment. Will you, need, will you try to do that? I haven't got, I haven't got any loudspeakers. Loud it's just a normal notebook without loudspeakers, and it's the second system. And I'm afraid I have to uh, switch off because there is no better um, hearing and, and talking with this in this session for me. I'm sorry. Okay, um, Mrs. Mrs. Hofrat, could you, if you try to mute your whole computer? and um talk speak after that so first mute the normal sound of your computer and then uh try to speak and we will test it one more time and if not we'll uh i think we'll continue straight to maria if that's okay with you so i've got no sound on my computer can you hear me yes without yes. oh yes now perfect But she can't hear this. <laughs> ah, she cannot hear it. Oh. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. No, it worked perfectly. So uh, please, yes. So please turn your sound off again and just uh, start speaking. And if we need to interrupt you or anything, we will put it in the chat. Okay, I try. I I hear in fact this horrible tone. Okay, but I'll, I will start. Um, just a few words to my person. I'm from the University of Cologne. I'm a librarian. And the Mrs. Hofrat, I'm sorry to Cologne. interrupt. And I'm the chairman of the Cologne Notfallverbund. Sorry. Mrs. Hofrat, it's still the sound in. No, and, it, uh, we... it, do, it doesn't make sense with me today. I say goodbye for today. I'm so sorry. Maybe, mm. but Nadine Thiel can tell you what I was telling you. Hmm. Okay. I'm, ter so. I'm terribly. Yeah. What shall we do, Sophie? We. It, Shall yeah, I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Hofflat. I I, uh, I muted you uh, because uh, the sound was really bad. Um, yeah, maybe uh, Miss Borisenko, would you? Um... Hello, Miss Borisenko, Hello. would you mind uh, starting yeah. your presentation? Uh, for sure. If you hear me nice. Yes, we okay. we hear you loud and clear. I will I will put up your. Um, your PowerPoint. Okay. Um, and I think I think that's best for now. And hopefully, um, maybe we can resolve the issues uh, with Mrs. Ofrat's sound and um, have her speak later on this evening. Um, and otherwise, uh, we'll we'll have to wait for the next edition of Connects. Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you switch on my presentation if it's possible? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah. Thank trying. you. Trying. One second. Yes, there it is. Perfect. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and to talk about an important topic: cultural heritage of Ukraine during the war and today i will speak my speech will be very personal it will be a personal story so first of all i would like to introduce myself um, i'm the conservator and i'm working in the uh, cultural heritage field almost 15 years and uh, during this period, I studied and completed different internships in Lithuania, Japan, China, Czech Republic, France, Portugal, and this year in Ger Germany. Um, in general, uh, I, I work as a, as a paper conservator and uh, also I work with uh, metal objects. 
and this is one of the example of my works. Uh, this example, it is large format architectural graphic object. Uh, it made in the mix technique, aquarelle, pencil, gouache, and ink. And uh, this how it was looked like before the restoration processes and after restor restoration processes. Um, so I was work with such objects for many years in museum. And also we have a lot of different interesting uh, projects and I will tell a little bit about them because uh, it's, it, it was my life before the war. So um, uh, my hometown is Kiev. It is really a very beautiful city and it is the capital of Ukraine. Uh, it's really very rich in cultural monuments and moder modern cultural objects, which are, they are very important component of the urban environment of the Kiev. Uh, also, we have a uh, very big amount of the modern sculptures. Uh, they are located through all city and many of these objects uh, have become favorite uh, for tourists and citizens and they bring um, people bring candies to these objects and try to protect from from the uh, cold in the winter they put sheriffs in them uh, and a lot of the generation uh, grew up near these sculptures near these objects and among them is my daughter the, therefore, several years ago, when some of the sculptures were lost due to the old age, we started an important conservation project together with uh, the author of these sculptures, and it was really necessary. So it all started with the sculpture Valerina, uh, which um, the sculpture made uh, 13 years ago, because uh, citizens, uh, people who were live on the street, they left him a note asking him to make a sculpture um, because of the ballerina, which were lived in the house opposite uh, this place. And he decided to, it was so nice dialogue with a, a sculpture. So he uh, made this sculpture. And after 12 years, the sculpture was broken by bandas. And we started volunteer project to preserve it and to show that such sculptures can uh, and should be preserved. And also to popularize the proper uh, uh, conservation and restoration of such objects. It was really very necessary. The sculpture was previously repaired by citizens, but these were poor uh, attempts that did more harm than good uh, to it. So after restoration, we returned uh, the sculpture to its place. It was in very nice condition and the citizens were very happy about it. And it was fe February 20, uh, 2022. And we have no any idea that very soon our lives will would absolutely change. And then on the February, uh, but uh, one more moment, because we have no any idea that happened the big war. So that time we had a lot of conservation plans project. Uh, we make a lot of researches. Uh, we make a lot of open science uh, and popular science lection for people to show them and to tell them a lot of about our culture and about cultural heritage preservation because it was really very necessary and because ukraine so long was under the russia a lot of people they have no any idea how deep and interesting uh, our life uh, our culture is so uh, but then the war come and uh, it broke thousand lives and it changed all uh, lives of all Ukrainians. But I need to mention that on the first day of the war, almost all museums workers went to work to save the collection. Because for them, these are not just objects, 
It is the meaning of their lives. I need to mention, uh, mention that uh, the salary of museum workers in general in, in Ukraine is very low. So to be uh, to work as a conservator or, or as a museum worker, you need to have more job uh, to pay for your life because it is like very big and nice hobby which you love love very much, but you need to survive. So for people uh, who work in uh, cultural heritage field in Ukraine, it's really very necessary to preserve and to save collection. And it's really the uh, one of the main values in their life. But on the first day of um, when the war start, we get a lot of challenges. And it was really very hard. First, very big challenge was the question about decision and responsibility. Because uh, the, all museum workers, all archive workers and library workers were on their positions. But uh, we all was try to call to the uh, Department of uh, Culture, but no one answered us. There was totally silence and no one wasn't know what to do. The second very big question was coordination and concurrence of action, actions, because uh, the question, the people who are responsible to make decisions wasn't on their plans, uh, places, working places. There was total silence. And the problem that uh, the simple workers have no any possibilities by law to have no any permission to make evacuation of collections without, without this permission. It was a real disaster. Uh, other very um, seriously qu serious uh, question was material support. Because even very big national uh, museums uh, have no any materials uh, for uh, packaging of the objects. And it's hard to say about small museums, small city museums, which have no any resources to save collections. The, sec the next question was the staff training, because uh, it was really hard question. And now we still have it. Um, the question is in staff training. Um, a lot of museum workers spent all their life in museums, but they have no any resources to get um, trainings on this topic, to trainings how to work during um, some extremal situation, how to what to do during uh, war situation, um, how to manage all question when. Uh, any people who are responsible for making decision uh, what to do if they uh, don't on their job positions. Um, and next question, which uh, we this is uh, experience of our museums, uh, our museum where I where work previously. It is uh, access to collection and the ability. Uh, to perform duties. The problem was that some people who was work in our museum, they um, was on occupied territory. And uh, the woman which was work with um, uh, storage sites, and she was she have access to the storage sites. She was on occupied territory and she was only one person who can who have access to this um, place. So it was almost impossible to get access to, um, to uh, save the collection. And the last and very necessary question, it is people. People who are under a risk of their life come to the museums. A lot of people uh, with, uh, when the war start, the directors, some of directors of museums, they uh, start to leave 
on their offices. They just uh, come in museum and live there for months, for first months when the war were uh, the, the big war were on our territory. So they uh, go out from museum only to buy some food or to manage some questions, and that's all. And it is a uh, really very necessary question because these people were very enthusiastic and they love uh, objects, cultural uh, collection, but uh, their safety and their life is really very necessary. And it was very necessary to save them and to give them possibility to be in safe place. Uh, on the first page, there was the photo, and this is the photo, how Museum of Grigory Skavorada looked like during the war. It was attacked by Russians and it was totally destroyed. Uh, Russian people say about that they um, try to put rockets only on military objects, but museums is not military objects, it is cultural objects. And a lot of museums were attacked, not for once times, it were attacked a lot of times, and it is really very big problem. But on the first uh, days of the war, uh, it was also very necessary to take care about objects which were outside, cultural heritage objects, and uh, people start to do all the best. Uh, some, um, some departments, cultural departments of different cities, there was total silence. Uh, we write the open letter with our colleagues to ask uh, that we want to help. But uh, during the war, it is really very hard for civilian people to do something because it is the question of uh, safe. It is a question. Um, that you, you can't just go out and do something. You need uh, to have permission for that. So we write the open letter. We ask uh, to give us possibility to preserve, uh, to make uh, uh, some preservation of these uh, objects, to do something. But it was very hard. And uh, then uh, this is the monument of uh, Dante in Kiev. And it was very interesting because when the uh, governmental institution um, started to work, the result was look like that. Uh, you can see how the Dante is look like. And people start to make the joke because it is the best way to avoid uh, very big stress. So they start to make uh, jokes and say, oh, it look like not the way to preserve the sculpture. And then we have also a lot of um, examples how better not to preserve the uh, cultural heritage objects because it, it doesn't work like that. But it is really necessary experience because then people start to make very nice projects of preservation cultural uh, cultural heritage objects. And this one of the nice examples, this is the sculpture of Mikhail Grushevsky, the first uh, Ukrainian president. And uh, this um, work was made by uh, architectural bureau, Kivian architectural bureau. Uh, and it's really, a uh, nice example of uh, preservation uh, object during the war. The next very big problem, it is the museums, because uh, it was really very hard to make evacuation, to get permission for the object evacuation. So um, this, how the local history museum of Kherson was looked like uh, after it was um, it was uh, let free after uh, the Russian occupation. Um, in this museum were 170,000 of objects, 
and it was very necessary and uh, very beautiful objects, uh, including the Scythian gold. But after uh, that uh, territory, the Kherson territory, were deoccupied, uh, Ukrainians discover that only less uh, on less than 20% of the object uh, was in museum. Every, a lot of, a lot of very big amount of the objects were um, stolen. It's something near uh, 15,000 of the objects were, were storing, uh, stole uh, during that uh, period. And it's really big amount. Uh, but it's really very necessary to say about the people who work in museums and they, uh, because previously I was saying that for people who work in museum, their cultural heritage objects is the one of the most necessary value of the life. It is the aim of the life. And a lot of people work in museum du during all their life and have very big passion to these objects. So uh, they make uh, such photos of uh, museum workers who want to show by these photos that they really miss very much about these uh, objects because it is really very necessary for them to take care about them. It is a very big part of their lives. <laughs> And people is really uh, fantastic because you know um, the, uh, that museum on the photo uh, it was uh, under occupation for uh, 36 days, and on the second day, uh, 25 of the February, four rockets go on this museum. It's museum. It's not military uh, object. It's really museum, but four rockets were bombed directly in the museum and there was uh, the big fire and people go in the building which were burned and take away the objects first uh, there was a lot of information that uh, unique object of uh, ukrainian prim primitivist artist uh, maria primachenko were um, destroyed but um, because of the people who uh, do care, these objects were saved because previously museum workers um, hide them, but then when the building of museum start uh, to be in fire, people just run away and save the, the objects. Uh, so that's why it's really very necessary to say that the main and necessary uh, in cultural heritage, it is the people, because people spread the culture. People is the career of culture. People have the story and they know the context of the culture. And uh, this situation that we have this war, it's, uh, it is very hard experience for all of us because we can see how people's lives are destroyed. And uh, a lot of people, it, it's really very hard to say, but I think that uh, all people, all Ukrainians now have the story uh, of um, their friends, the uh, people from their family that were killed during this war. And, these people which were killed, they will never uh, bring their culture anymore. But it's really very necessary to remember that uh, our history always repeat. And this, which we have now on the beginning on, of the 21st century, and it's really very hard to believe that it is possible to have the war in the middle of the Europe. Uh, in 21st century but we we it was previously and i want to tell you very short story which represent very necessary moment of our culture on the beginning of the uh, 20th century ukraine 
um, want to become independents. So in 1980, Ukraine said that we want to be independent. We don't want to be under anyone. And it was very hard situation because uh, once again, Russian, they say that they want set us free because that moment because of chauvinism. So they come to free us. And um, at that moment, the head of Ukraine was Simon Putlura, and he decided that it's really very necessary to represent Ukrainian culture and to show to the world that uh, Ukraine is not the same. Ukrainian culture is not the same with the Russians. We are really very different, and it's really very necessary to represent. So we have very, very old pre-Christian ritual song. And this song were singing for many, many, many uh, years. This song is a symbol of the life giving. It was previously on pre-Christian uh, times. It was always singing the, on the beginning of the summer as a symbol of life giving, as a symbol of the hope. So, um, it, this song was very beautiful. So uh, our compositor, Leontovich, he write the music for this song. And um, then Simon Petlura decided that it's, it would be very necessary to represent this so song, to show this song to the world. And uh, I need to say you that every Christmas now, you hear this song. This song become very popular in all world. But now, because previously it was named in Ukrainian uh, Shedrik, it is life giving in translation. Now this song have named Carol of the Bells. And this song you hear every Christmas as a symbol of the hope to have nice future. And this song was the instrument of cultural diplomacy in Ukraine. We were used this song to show that we are not the same with the Russians, that we have very deep and very necessary culture. And we are not the same, we very separate. So this is the symbol of, of, of us, but now, a lot of a lot of Ukrainians were spread uh, in all world because of the war, and uh, a lot of Ukrainians are really very talented and very high skillful. Sculptors, uh, painters, scientists, uh, people who can do a lot, and now they represent the culture, and it is the way the preservation of culture because other country give us the possibility to survive and to spread and to represent our culture. It's really very necessary. But it is also very necessary not to repeat the history because um, in the uh, previous century, Russians were occupied us. And the very necessary moment that uh, Mikhail Leontovich on, on that year when the song became very, very popular, uh, some men knocked at the house of the parents, Mikhailo Leontovich, and he were there. And uh, he asked to be in this house for one night to stay there, and they give him this opportunity. And it was the Russian agent who just killed Mikh uh, Mikhailo Leontovich. And uh, the problem was that Russian government don't want to let uh, people who uh, are spread Ukraine and represent Ukrainian culture, they don't want to let them uh, to do this. And uh, he was only one person in millions other which were killed during that period. And now we have seen the same. So it's really very necessary now to give us possibility not to uh, repeat the uh, previous mistake. And it is really very necessary to 
to have to struggle for our independence, to struggle for independence of all of us. And it's really very necessary to represent and to spread the culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for your contribution, Ms. Ms. Borisenko. It's, it's very impressive and uh, thank you for your powerful uh, speech or talk, let's say. So we, uh, in the meantime, we tried to fix some problems um, we had before with the contribution of Mrs. Hofrat and Ms. Thiel. And uh, we are try still trying to fix that. And I would suggest that we now proceed with the first Q&A session, then we will have a pause. And after the pause, we will have another try with uh, Ms. Hofrat and Ms. Thiel, if this is okay for you. Um, so yes, you cannot answer, so it must be okay for you. Um, let's proceed to the Q&A session to the first. And uh, we have some questions to Mr. Bushenaki. Um, Mr. Bushenaki, could you unmute your microphone, please? We would like to um, yes. put some questions. So the first question came from Friederike Wentig, and she uh, first uh, quotes, uh, thank you for this interesting talk. What do you think governments should do to be prepared for emergency situations like criminal attacks or war destruction of cultural heritage? This is the first question. Yes, this is a, a very important point, uh, uh, which is linked to the preventive action uh, when we have now the experience of so many conflicts where cultural heritage is uh, a target, and as it has been shown very clearly by our colleague from uh, Ukraine about the disaster. Uh, so the, what is important, I think, now, uh, and uh, we are working also with an, an institution called Alif. It was created, it has its base in uh, Geneva, and it is uh, giving uh, great support in particular to Ukraine during this uh, last month uh, for the museums, for the sites. And uh, we are starting to think about how to put a, a vision, a proactive vision about what is happening in the world, not only in one place, but in many other places. We know that unfortunately, because of the climate change, because of some complications uh, of, of ethnic uh, uh, life uh, and difficulties, in particular in Africa, we want to uh, work actually with the, the Smithsonian Institute in, in Washington, with the uh, institutions uh, in, in France and uh, in Germany, in order to see how we can prevent uh, such situation uh, before the crisis in, is starting. So this is a, a topic that is now in the mind of the colleagues, the experts, not only in conservation, but also the experts in uh, political vision uh, and uh, uh, pre pre prevention. Okay, I think that already an answer to the second part of the question of Ms. Ventig. She asked, yes. or is this, is this this task only for UNESCO? Let's proceed to the next question. Um, it comes from Uncle Tom Bulaj. Thank you for the presentation. Was it possible for UNESCO to engage in a, a conversation with the destroyers as to their motive for the destruction of heritage? It's a difficult question because uh, the people, I mean, the, these groups, they are not, uh, except when there was a, a, an official uh, intentional destruction like the one, the one done by the Taliban 
in Afghanistan in 2001, we, we knew that uh, the, the head of the Taliban was going to destroy the Buddha. We tried, um, you know, I, I, I was at that time the assistant director general for culture at UNESCO. So I tried, first of all, to send a mission uh, of a former French ambassador to Pakistan and Afghanistan. His name is very easy to retain, Mr. Pierre La France, Ambassador Pierre La France. He was a teacher of uh, the languages of Central Asia, the Pashtun and the Dari. He went very quickly, thanks to the Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs of France and the Ministry of Interior of Pakistan, and he went to Kandahar to speak with the Taliban in March, early March 2001. From there, he phoned me and said, you know, I'm not the person. I said, why? He said, but because these people, they don't want money. They, want, they don't want to be recognized. They said that it is a religious problem. So then I had to turn to another solution, how to speak to these people with religious people. So I obtained, uh, it's a long story, but I make it short. I obtained the possibility to have a communication phone communication between the director general of UNESCO at that time, Mr. Koshiro Matsura, and the president of Egypt uh, on that time, uh, President Mubarak. And we were asking President Mubarak of Egypt to send a mission of religious people from the oldest university of Cairo, which is called University El Azhar. We organized the visit. These people went to Kandahar. They spoke to the Taliban and the Taliban said, we don't, we don't listen to you. You are uh, totally um, at, at, the, at the service of the West. So this was the third, uh, the second tentative. The third, the third one, I contacted the Minister of Culture of uh, Social Affairs. The lady who was minister was member of the executive board of UNESCO and in a long discussion, we, we obtained that she would, she would travel with the Minister of Interior of Pakistan to go and see the head of the Taliban. The head of the Taliban did receive her because he was against uh, talking to women, as you can imagine. And he's, he received the minister and he said, I cannot change uh, my order because it's an, uh, an order of God. I give you all this story to, sh to show you that it is not easy to speak to extremist people. It's not easy. And in this case, it was people who were having the, the seat, they, had, they were having their capital, they were having their ministries. But when we are speaking, for example, of these, actually the terrorists who are killing people in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Nigeria, with whom you are going to speak, it is very complicated. I, I know that uh, it is sometimes uh, very frustrating to see that we cannot speak with these people. I can, can imagine, yes. And this brings us to a point that we need a whole evening to answer all those uh, yeah, questions. We have a lot of more time. Um, maybe um, one more question. Uh, Mr. Bushenaki, it, it's coming from Joshko Bogdanovich. Uh, Mr. Bushenaki, thank you for the very interesting presentation. War and aggression on my country and hometown Dubrovnik are part of my childhood mem memories. I remember yes. all historical monuments were marked with UNESCO flags as zero category sites. It was supposed to raise awareness among aggressors that they should not destroy such heritage sites. Does UNESCO have the same practice nowadays? And are there any positive examples where monuments are exempted from destruction due to such flags and signs? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I think that for me, it's a bit emotional because in December 1991, when we, we heard and see uh, the destruction in uh, Dubrovnik, I was sent, uh, I was still young at that time, I was sent to Dubrovnik and we tried immediately to work with the population, with the municipality, and to find the way to restore the roofs 
because it was winter and the, in the monasteries and in the number of houses and buildings, uh, the rain and the, and the you know, water was pouring inside the historic monuments. So we find very quickly, thanks to a contribution from uh, France, uh, uh, a, a place near Marseille where they were uh, able to provide us immediately with tiles uh, uh, of traditional form, because not all the tiles are similar. And we wanted to have something which was similar to the uh, roofs of the monasteries of Dubrovnik. We did it, and this was a very successful uh, project because uh, in a very uh, short time, a lot of monasteries were recovered by these tiles. We had a, a lady uh, expert in uh, conservation who was present with the conservators from Croatia. I did the same in Vukovar, since your colleague is, is uh, from Croatia. I went also on mission to Vukovar, which was at that time occupied by the uh, Serbian troops. And I obtained that the objects from the museum, the municipal museum of Vukovar, which were uh, transferred to Belgrade, to be returned to, to Vukovar after restoration of the city and the monument. So yes, we have some this kind of uh, operation where uh, we are able to provide uh, the, the funds and also the, the technical support. It's the same actually in, uh, in Ukraine. I have actually two colleagues present uh, in Ukraine, Madame Krista Pikat, uh, she is the head of Department of Urgencies and uh, uh, another colleague from Italy who was working with me when we were faced with the situation in Iraq. So we have people who are experienced in working in situations with the situation in Iraq. So we have people who are experienced in working in situation of war, unfortunately. And we are trying to give as much as possible the, the support and the material in order to protect the monuments. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, the operation of Cambodia was one of the most successful operation because uh, we were able to stop the illicit traffic of cultural property. There were a lot of statues, the small Apsara uh, inscriptions uh, from the Khmer temples. We were able to stop this with the help of Interpol and ICOM. And we were able also uh, to provide resources to the keepers and to the population, as uh, this colleague from Ukraine was uh, saying to us, uh, the population was very keen to protect uh, the, the heritage. I think we have to do both, you know, to work with the authorities uh, because they are responsible for cultural heritage and also to sensitize the, po the population, which in general is very keen for, the, uh, for, for keeping, for conserving uh, their heritage, because it's part of their memory and it's part of their identity. Thank you. Thank you very much for this answer. And now out of time, reasons, we have to go on. Thank you, Mr. Mushenaki. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, particularly uh, now we have the, f the final uh, assessment for Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, actually uh, at UNESCO, we have actually uh, the, the figures of how many objects, how many sites, how many museums have been uh, destroyed during this terrible war. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can have it quickly for you. Yes, the, on the 22nd of March, 2023, UNESCO has verified damages to 248 sites, 107 religious sites, 21 museums, 81 historic buildings, 35, 34 buildings dedicated to cultural activities, and 12, 12 libraries. So you can see that the, the, the damage is enormous. And uh, yeah. we have to hope that as soon as peace uh, is obtained, uh, there should be a very, very important international uh, campaign from all countries uh, helping uh, our colleagues and friends in, in Ukraine. I visited Ukraine when it was 
in peace because I was uh, giving, you know, the certificate for the inscription of the church uh, in, in the center of, uh, of uh, Kiev. And I have seen so many sites, so many monuments of very, very important uh, value. I hope all these will be one day uh, restored and returned to a normal life. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you again. And Sophie, you will continue with questions to Ms. Boris Tenko. Yes, I think that this really, uh, this closing remarks by uh, Mr. Bushinaki really ties in nicely with the next questions we have for uh, Ms. Borisenko. Um, Ms. Borisenko, could you please unmute? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, thank you so much for being with us this evening and your very personal and touching talk. Um, um, the first question is actually mine, uh, and I think it ties in nicely with uh, the last remarks. Um, do you feel that especially museums and cultural heritage sites were um, used as a target uh, because they represent Ukrainian culture? Yes, for sure, because um, erasing the culture, it is a part of genocide. And I'm totally sure that that which we can see now, it is real genocide. So for sure, it is real target because we, we can see that a lot of museums were bombed not once, they were bombed for many times until they were crushed absolutely. So yes, it's real target. Yeah, I think I think the um, next time, the next question uh, by uh, Mariana Fitvitska uh, ties in with that as well. Uh, do you think that Russians want to steal Ukrainian history? Yes, for sure. It's not the secret because we all know that uh, firstly Russian were named Moscovia and then after some period it were uh, renamed because all imperi need to have a beautiful history, but they don't have it. So they prefer to uh, steal it and also, and, and also the main question that they need uh, Ukrainian territories also because uh, we, we have fantastic and very rich country. So that's why. That's, yeah, it's terrible. Um, I've got another question by uh, Corina Mali, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, I'm sorry, if I don't. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting and also touching speech. Uh, do you think that it's possible to gain back the stolen objects? And if so, uh, how long do you think it will take? Or do you think that most objects got destroyed as a symbol of erasing the uh, Ukrainian culture? It, it is a very nice question, and it's really a hard question in one time. Uh, because we have this problem not now. It's appeared in 2014. So the Russians start to um, stole our cultural heritage objects and uh, museum objects. Uh, they start to make... Uh, the um, uh, archaeological excavation on Ukrainian territory, on occupied Ukrainian territories. And uh, for us, it's real disaster. So it, it, it's very hard to manage with this question because of the amount of the objects which were stolen by Russians. And uh, now it's really very hard to uh, account how much it were uh, uh, stolen by them. So uh, we like a big part uh, of this object, people who work in the cultural field, they uh, do monitoring the people who are uh, live on the occupied territories. They also give some information, but now it is really very hard. So I hope that occupied territory will, will be uh, for some period, they will be free and then uh, we'll start very hard work to find these objects. And also it's necessary to know that a very big part of the cultural objects are in the um, collections of some people. It's not only on museums collections or uh, somewhere, but 
people stole it and then they start to uh, uh, try to sell it on internet auctions or uh, other platforms. So yes, it's a hard question. Yes, I, I can imagine. Um, thank you so much. And, and I think we all hope for a quick end to this war soon. Um, so you make a return you. home as well. Um, thank you very so much. much for your time. Okay. Um, well, thank you again, Mr. Bushinaki, and of course, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Boris Borisenko. And thank you all for the many interesting questions. Um, I want to take this opportunity. We'll we'll go back to business after this um, heavy subject we just uh, um, heard of. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to point out the book of abstracts to you. Um, sorry to be uh, this uh, to have this 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 transition. Um, this PDF can be found on our shared Dropbox folder and contains abstracts of all papers and posters of this edition of Connext. And you can find the link to the folder in the chat. I will put it in there um, in the break. And in this folder, you can also find the posters of Connects, among, among which uh, today's poster pitch by uh, Emmeline, who's up uh, after the break. Um, so we'll have a short break. We're already 30 minutes behind schedule, I think. Um, so let's be back in eight minutes at uh, 20, to eight, 20 to nine. Um, and we'll continue then um, with the paper presentations by our students. Um, so we'll be back in a few minutes and continue then.
Okay, welcome back to everyone. We had a little uh, or a short break, uh, but now we will continue with the next contributions from uh, four students. And um, first of all, I have to say that we decided to postpone the missing uh, contribution of Mrs. Hofrath and Mrs. Thiel to one of the ne next sessions so that we can take care for the technical problems before. Um, I hope this finds your uh, applause. Um, okay, let's proceed to the next contribution. First off, after the break, we have a paper presentation by Katja Schüller a student from the Cologne Institute of Conservation Sciences. Her bachelor's thesis was about a precious console from the Museum of the City of Bad Neuen Ahrweiler. Ahrweiler is located in the valley of the River Ahr and was one of the most affected um, regions during the highly dramatic flood of 2021. Katja will now present the main results of her thesis. In the meantime, she is a master's student of our institute. Katja, please, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would also like to thank to the keynote speakers for these very moving presentations. And now thanks for the opportunity to present to you my work on this object. I wrote my bachelor's thesis in spring of 2022, so one year ago, at the Cologne Institute of Conservation Sciences in the Department of Wooden Artifacts and Modern Materials. The topic of this paper is the conservation of a flood damaged object with colored coatings. The object is the carved wooden wall console with pigmented oil-based coatings in a dark brown color applied on its entire surface, except for the backside. You can see three images of the console on this slide. Here you can see the contents of my presentation. After an introduction, I will tell you about the object's condition before I move on to the conservation proposal. I will then talk about the treatment measures and come to a conclusion in the end of my presentation. Now I will start by briefly explaining the background of my work on the object. Uh, Mr. Krupa al already said a little bit about it. After the flood disaster in July 2021, my department agreed to carry out the restoration of a total of four objects from the currently closed Museum of the City of Bad Neuner Ahrweiler, including this console. And there are even more objects at our institute and other departments. These objects lay in the flooded museum depot for about two weeks before they could be recovered. I was interested in this object for my bachelor's degree because I, it has such an eventful history. So I took on the task of working on it. The main goals of my bachelor's thesis were to examine the wall console and to develop a conservation proposal as well as appropriate treatment measures. The focus was on cleaning and consolidation. I will now introduce you to the object itself. First, a few words on the art historical and stylistic aspects of the object. The wall console once served as a support platform for a sculpture. It belongs to the art architectural movement of the Gothic revival and was probably created in the second half of the 19th century. Its decorations show a hanging arched frieze with tracery carvings as well as foliage carvings depicting ivy leaves. On the right picture, you can see the small spherical fruit clusters of the ivy, outlined in red. There is only little known about the object's origin and provenance. The console probably comes from a church in the Arvala region and found its way into the museum's collection in the 20th century. In the next part of my presentation, I will summarize the findings about the wall console that I found out through my investigations during and after my thesis. To learn more about its con construction, Mr. Krupa and I took an X-ray of the object. I then mapped all of the different parts in different colors 
as you can see on the right here. The console is made up of 24 parts, which are connected by wooden joints, gluing and nails, and the wood is oak wood. Now onto the colored coatings of the object. I examined the coatings visually and minimally invasive. The surface texture varies from thick and rough to thin and smooth. You can see this on the two images on the left. The object also has had different phases of coatings. As you can see on the bottom right picture, which shows the top of the console, it has been varnished while the sculpture was standing on top of the object. object. Um, did my, can you still see my presentation? Okay, I will uh, share it again. Which slide were you were you at? Um, I think I was on uh, the uh, I was uh, just about to go on the seventh slide. This one. Uh, uh, didn't, yes. Yes. No, oh, it's gone again. Okay. Oh. One second. Should I'll. I'll okay. <laughs> no, I'll fix it. One second. Okay. Yes, try again. It should, okay. should work now. Yes. Yeah, it should. Yeah, it should work now. <laughs> yeah. We hope for the best. So, My apologies. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, on this slide, you can see two uh, microscope images of a sample I took. Uh, one image in normal light and one in UV radiation. The summary of the investigations of the coatings is the object had probably three phases of surface treatment and at least two of the coatings I found contain pigments. And the most important information from, for my work on the object is that the coatings contain oil. On the next few slides, I will briefly describe the condition of the wall console before any treatments. The damage to the wood and the construction can be summarized as manageable. There are some loose parts and a few small lost pieces. Some of the cracks go deep into the object as you can see on the X-ray image, because some of the wood parts have been used with the most inner part of the tree, the core. So the cracks are results of the different levels of tension in the wood. But even these deep cracks do not danger the overall stability of the object. I have mapped the visible losses of the colored coatings here on the image on the left. There is only little loss, but of course it is unknown how great the loss under the dirt crusts actually is. The images on the right show damages of the coatings. On the top image, you can see how dried sediments are causing the coatings to lift off in a bowl shape and threatening their loss. There is definitely a high need for action to prevent further loss of the colored coatings. Due to the flood disaster, this object has the special case of severe dirt deposits and a little bit of fungi on the dirt. On my mapping on this image, I have only mapped the most severe dirty areas because actually there is a little bit of dirt on the entire surface. And there is definitely a high need for action on the dirt. So a very short summary of the condition of the object before I started working on it is, Despite the extreme event of the flood disaster in the history of the object, only minor losses of the wood substance and manageable losses of the coatings can be recorded, and only the dirt is very severe. But due to the dirt and fungi, appropriate work safety measures have to be taken when working on the cleaning of the object. This means that dust and skin contact should be avoided and appropriate protective gear has to be worn. Protect your clothing, wear gloves, and wash hands after handling the object. If dust can't be avoided, wear respiratory protection and eye protection. And the waste of the dirt should be given to hazardous material disposal, just to be on the safe side. I will now talk very briefly about the investigations of the dirt from the flooded museum depot and why these work safety measure, measures I just showed to you should be followed. 
In the first master semester, we did a group project on this investigation regarding the following questions. Does the dirt contain fossil oils from heating oils and from cars? And the second question, have the paintings from the flooded museum depot been treated with a toxic fungicide? A little side note here, the objects from the flooded museum depot went to different temporary storages after their recovery and before they came to our institution. The wall console was not treated with fungicides after the flood. But we were informed that some paintings from the same museum depot were treated with fungicide at the temporary storage they went to. So we wanted to work on these two questions by investigating the dirt from a painting. For this, we did an extraction with acetone in this Soxlet extractor you can see on the image. The acetone should solve the potential fungicide and oil contents in the dirt. The extract we obtained in this way was used for a PI GCMS investigation. To summarize our findings real quick, we did detect a fungicide in the dirt extract from the painting. The two very big peaks on the chromatogram on the right are from the molecules of the fungicide. We also detected several long chain hydrocarbons, which are hints that the dirt does indeed contain fossil oils. And we also detected other substances, for example, the molecule of a harmful plasticizer. But for now, the quantities of these substances in the dirt are still unclear. Nevertheless, from what we know now, work safety measures have to be taken when working with the objects from the flooded depot. Although the wall console has not been treated with the fungicide, it seems probable that the dirt on this object contains other potentially harmful substances which have been found in the dirt from the painting because, as I said, they are from the same flooded depot. And we shouldn't forget the fungi in the dirt. So to be on the safe side, the basic safety measures I just talked about a few slides ago should be followed. And as far as I know, it is also planned to make a publication about the investigations of the dirt soon. There are still questions left and our institute is still working on a lot of topics surrounding the flood disaster. This sums up the investigations of the object. For my conservation proposal, I of course spoke with the contact person from Ahrweiler and my supervisors. I will now summarize the proposal, proposal briefly. The object's future environment will be museal. The wall console cannot and should not be restored to an earlier state. And the conservation proposal aims at achieving a state in which the flood disaster can still be seen and which at the same time allows the original aesthetics of the wall console to become visible again. This results in the following treatment measures to be implemented. The dirt must be removed, the color co colored coatings must be consolidated and the wooden fragments and loose parts must also be secured. To put the plant treatment into practice, I did pretests for the consolidation of the coatings and probably because they contain the oils, they can be consolidated just by a little bit of heat. I also did a lot of pretests for the cleaning. I can't elaborate too long here, but there were two main problems. The first problem was that very often the dirt deposits could not be removed from the valleys of the object surface. You can see this in the top images. The left image is a before photo. The right image is a photo after the pretest, which in this case was done with a compress. And as you can see, there is still a lot of dirt left. And the second main problem was that additives to the water, like for example, tree ammonium citrate, attack the colored coatings. And of course, we do not want that. The bottom right picture, which was taken after the cleaning pretests, shows some loss of the coating. So as the cleaning of this object is quite difficult, uh, I tried to further elaborate on the cleaning methods in my master studies. I participated in a course that dealt with laser cleaning and conservation. So this was a great opportunity to try out laser cleaning on the wall console. Sadly, a testing on the wall console itself did not work out. The test on the object was done with a neodym yak laser. The problem was that the settings needed to reduce the dirt, unfortunately, altered the colored coatings of the object. You can clearly see the area where the laser beam hit the coatings and change them. And of course, we do not want that. But on a positive note, 
The laser cleaning with the neodymium yak laser works very well on bare oak wood with, uh, without coatings, as this is a so-called self-limiting clean effect of the laser. This means that the dirt absorbs the laser radiation and thus is removed, and the wood itself is, itself is not affected. On these images, you can see the back of a piece of the wall console, which does not have any coatings. And in the area framed in red, I could successfully remove the dirt from the flood disaster off of the object surface. So although the laser cleaning I tested sadly did not work on the coatings, it could be a cleaning method for the backside of the object, as this part of the console does not have, does not have any coatings. But now back to the coated surfaces. In the end, for the cleaning of the object, I did what I called a water-based cleaning with mechanical support. This means that I carefully clean with wet sponges and cotton swabs, and if there is still dirt left in the deeper areas of the surface, I take a wet brush with, with um, stiff but also fine brush hairs and brush out the dirt. And of course, I pat dry the cleaned area, and I just use water, no additives. And most important, the thermal consolidation happens parallel to the cleaning, so I don't clean away any flakes of the colored coatings. On the image here, you can see my tools and materials. Um, now I will show you some photos of the results of the conservation. Here you can see images which show consolidation of the coatings as well as cleaning results. And I think it worked out quite well this way. Here you can see the left side of the object before and after the conservation. As these treatment methods are quite time consuming, I unfortunately did not finish the entire surface of the console during my bachelor's degree. So here's another before and after shot of the freeze. A little summary of this, these treatments I carried out is, like I just said, they are more time consuming than expected. And besides all caution, the cleaning with water and the brush still means moisture exposure and a certain level of mechanical stress to the object. But on a positive note, the treatments do meet the demands of the conservation proposal and can be implemented successfully. So far, it is the best option we have because the other pretests and even the laser cleaning sadly did not work out. A little conclusion is that many people all over the country are still dealing with the aftermath of the flood disaster. And this includes people at our Conservation Institute too, who are working, uh, still working on many objects of the flooded depot of the Museum of Bad Neuner Ahrweiler and other places. The next presentation tonight is about an object from this depot too. And I will also continue working on securing the loose wooden parts on this wall console soon. The flood was a terrible disaster, obviously. And the flooded museum depot did not only mean terrible destruction of many objects, but also a damage of the collective memory of the community of Bad Neuner Ahrweiler, as it contains so many objects of regional historical significance. And to conserve these rescued objects means a lot. And this is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank my fellow students with whom I did the group work. And thank you to my lecturers too. And of course, thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to the following presentations of this year's Look Connect. Thank you very much, Katja, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, Next up is uh, Mario Sebastian Volta. Uh, he's also one of Andreas' students at Cologne, and his paper again deals with a victim of the fl flood at uh, Arwalte, Arwalte, sorry. Uh, Mario is a student. Mario is a student of the fourth uh, bachelor semester, and he currently works on a chest made of different materials. In particular, wood, metal, leather, and paper. And how did the various mat materials react first on drowning in the river and afterwards during drying? Uh, Mario will now provide us some answers and will also present first results concerning conservation restoration measures. Please go ahead, Mario. Uh, 
And now you, you, you're very difficult to hear. A little bit, but maybe closer to the camera. To the microphone, I mean, sorry. Maybe you can put up your microphone more because you are very, very silent. Mario, are you still there? Hmm. Mario, are you doing okay? Maybe we change. We cannot hear you. Ah, OK. No, there is, is no this? sound. No, can't hear, hear you at all. Uh, Emmeline, would you mind um, going first? No, I wouldn't mind at all. OK, OK. You also have voice problem for <laughs> a call. Oh. Um, yes. <laughs> but you're, you're really, we can hear you loud and clear. So um, oh, that's very good to hear. If you if, give me one second, I will make sure to put up your presentation. And great that you can um, go first while we uh, try to uh, solve the mic issues. Mm -hmm. um, In the meantime, I'm going to announce you. <laughs> Yes. Next up is Emmeline Fahey. Um, I hope this was the right pronunciation. Bachelor yes, student in book conservation at University of Antwerp. She has prepared a poster that you can access on Dropbox using the link in the chat. She will give a short poster pitch on the subject. Emmeline, the audience is yours. Thank you for Hi. being with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. and thank you all for attending um, this session. And also thank you very much to Sophie and uh, Vincent Cottesel for giving me this opportunity to present uh, my uh, current research that I'm doing this year. As, uh, as aforementioned, I have a cold, so I will keep this very brief to not strain my voice too much. So let's just dive right in. My research is dedicated about uh, assessing the bioremedial bio properties of bioarocline. As of right now, a lot of uh, libraries and archives are trying to improve their collection care, either by relocating to greener, newer buildings, or by trying to improve their uh, climate system. But not all institutions have the uh, means or manpower to do that. And as such, they have expressed the need for safer, greener products. And as such, uh, a lot of uh, alternative altern uh, products are being put on the market that are alternatives to, re re to radiation, which is commonly employed in uh, the conservation of paper. However, uh, their properties are not fully uh, known yet. And one of these uh, products is BioOrg Aroclean. And uh, to keep it very brief, I will explain uh, the working mechanisms of, uh, of BioOrg Aroclean. Basically, it's a product that contains uh, positive organisms in the forms of uh, aerosols that once deposited on a material substrate, they form a biofilm that uh, metabolizes dirt and uh, that uh, metabolizes dirt, dust and mold. Now, the 
BioOrg products have been primarily been used in office spaces. And it's basically products meant to improve the um, atmosphere. Like it was basically very useful during Corona, but it does uh, show potential to be used in the field of conservation. And that's what I'm trying to research this year. And as such, uh, my basic methodology is that we're going to expose uh, both contaminated and non-contaminated uh, documents to the aerosols of um, BioOrg or Clean. And we'll use a uh, fluorescent microscopy to analyze and monitor fungal activity and development. And based on uh, to see if, for example, uh, the fungi are still active or if they are dying. And based on that, we will we'll be mechanically cleaning the documents. And once that has once that has been uh, successful, then we're going to re-exposure everything again, but this time to the to the three common uh, the three common groups uh, of fungi in paper conservation, which is Asperium, Cladosporium. And the as of right now, the other one is uh, right now is missing. So my apologies for that, but we'll be exposing them to the three most common groups of fungi. And we'll be studying uh, reactivity through chrom uh, chromatic mass spectrum. <laughs> Sorry. And the research is still going on, but our basic aim is to assess whether bio or clean is a cost effective product for minimizing fungal activity. And our also our other main research aim is to assist conservators, uh, conservators in the preservation of library and archival materials. And as I said, the research is still going on, so I can't uh, present results as of yet. And currently, the research, as it is uh, as of right now, on hold. I do hope to resume it uh, this summer and perhaps also next year. But what I do hope is that uh, BioOrg Clean at least will prove uh, to be effective to minimize fungal activity on storage shelves because uh, cons book conservators have expressed the need that um, they would very much like to prefer it uh, if uh, storage shelves and boxes uh, stay, uh, stay clean, or at least that fungal activity will be less there. And I also hope that pre-sprayed uh, pre documents will be easier to clean and that treated uh, objects, uh, the treated documents won't reactivate as quick, uh, that mold won't reactivate as quickly on pre sprayed documents. And that was everything in a nutshell, and I hope that I'm not over time. But thank you all very much uh, for your attention and for listening. Thank you, uh, Emeline. Uh, for this uh, very sor short introduction. Uh, I want to remind you all that the poster itself is, uh, you can find on the Dropbox uh, for more information. Um, well, the next presenter is uh, Josipa Vodopia, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, we'll um, try Mario again after her. I think uh, that would be the best. Um, Josipa is a second year graduate student um, at the University of Dubrovnik. Let me share your presentation. Um, majoring in wood uh, of the Department of Art and Restoration. She did her professional practice at the Croatian Conservation Institute in Dubrovnik and Zagreb. And at the university workshop, she mainly worked on furniture conservation and restoration, while at the Croatian Conservation Institute, uh, she also encountered polychromy and gilding. Uh, so, Josipa, uh, you're up next. Uh, good luck. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. So, this presentation is about the conservation restoration treatments on the dressing table from the 18th century. The object is in property of the Bromnik uh, Science Library, located in Scotchibuha Summer Villa. Uh, 
I will briefly tell about the history of the summer villa and the library and how the war affected it. And after that, I will give an insight into the historical and artistic context of the object and what conservation restoration treatments were carried out. Uh, so the summer villa was built between uh, 1574 and 1588 by local craftsmen in Bonino, Dubrovnik. Uh, the Renaissance didn't care uh, about, uh, didn't create a home to correspond to the real purpose of life, but uh, was built for the beauty and stylistic purity. So uh, the Stepovich family held the property until 1627. Uh, and after that, uh, Ivan Guntulic bought it at an auction and so on. Uh, for, uh, uh, through the 19th and 20th century, uh, the property was ruined and neglected. And during the, world, the Second World War, uh, the summer villa was mostly restored, but uh, some changes were made. And after the national liberation struggle, it became a uh, part of the national property. Uh, so uh, first attempts uh, to establish a public library in Dubrovnik were made in 16th century. Uh, and after the fire in 1934, the books were moved to Rector's Palace. And uh, just in 1941, Dubrovnik Library began its public work. and. Uh, collection of the former Jesuits college was added later. Uh, about the scientific library, it was established in 1950 and was divided into two departments. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's of national and international importance due to its wealth and value. Uh, uh, during the attacks on Dubrovnik in 1991 and 1992, uh, within the general, general aggression of Croatia, Yugoslav army didn't consider the fact that Dubrovnik as history, historic entity uh, of world's importance has been placed on the UNESCO heritage list based on the World Heritage Convention from uh, 1972. And the current condition is a direct consequence of war in 1992 on this uh, Buha summer villa. And you can see on this uh, photo uh, on the left side, it is photo right after the shelling in 1992. And you can also see a condition now. Uh, so uh, the point, uh, the object of uh, this discussion, the dressing table, uh, it is uh, from 18th century. It, said it stands on four cab uh, cabriolet shaped legs. Uh, top surface can be opened and it's attached with two metal hinges. Uh, below, it's a storage, storage space with two hidden drawers. On the inside of the sur top surface is a frame which is assumed to be for a mirror. Uh, the interior is lined with paper and the entire table is, is decorated with geometric shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is moving. Uh, sorry, just a second. Uh, so, uh, uh table is decorated with geometric shapes made with marquetry, creating a herringbone effect. On the top surface is a floral motif and stucco decorations on the edges. Uh, the table is completely varnished. So we did a, a microscopic uh, identification, which led to conclusion that the uh, wooden structure is made of spruce wood, veneered with light walnut wood, and the inlays are made uh, uh, of light walnut wood and dark veneer, which uh, imitates ebony. And in order to be sure that the veneer is light walnut, uh, we made a microscopic preparation in glycerin. And you can see it on the pictures here. 
Uh, so changes in society at the beginning of the 18th century and growing popularity of writing and gaming influenced uh, a lot uh, uh, furniture design. So many new types of uh, tables were created. Uh, comfort became a much higher priority in the 18th century. It created the need for lightweight and portable tables that can be placed anywhere. And table to be restored is in Louis XV style. Uh, and this can be dedicated for features such as uh, cabriolet shaped uh, legs, uh, geometric marquetry with central motifs such as flower or wind rose or etc. And uh, here is an example of a uh, Louis XV style table. Uh, so uh, these are the uh, found pictures of our condition of the table. Uh, it has an uh, unstable and weakly fixed construction. Uh, part of the leg was broken. Uh, we can also see uh, influence of biological activity such as numerous holes caused by woodworms. Uh, boards that make the top surface are separated due to fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Uh, veneers were separated from the surface and cracked, and also some parts of veneers are missing. Uh, varnish, varnish is very worn off on the top, on, on the upper surface of the table, while the original varnish has been preserved because it was covered with the layer of a darker varnish. And there is a bond, bound and unbound dirt on the entire surface, which also affects the appearance of the final layer. Uh, the paper layer inside uh, the table is very worn due to use. Uh, we can also see an influence of biological activity such as fungi, but it's uh, not active. Uh, and there are ink and uh, water stains on the surface and uh, some metal parts were found in the drawers and they were covered in rust due to moisture. Uh, so the treatments involved the uh, examination of the table to determine the extent of the damages. The work approach is complete and the main goals are removal of surface, surface dirt and overpaint, strengthening and stabilization of the wooden structure and reconstruction of the missing parts. Uh, the removal of unbound surface impurities began with the dry cleaning with brush and vacuum cleaner. After that, uh, cleaning tests were made based on the pH uh, of the object, object, which is 6, slightly acidic. And based on the test, it was concluded that the 4% solution of citric acid effectively removes surface impurities. And the entire object was cleaned with mentioned solution and neutralized with distilled water. I didn't put the pictures because uh, the, the varnish will be removed completely. So uh, it was necessary to remo remove varnish from the top surface, surface because it was completely worn away and visible only on the edges, on, on the edges of the table and in pores. Uh, and the additional varnish on the lower part of the table is also removed and the original layer beneath is preserved. And be before performing the procedure, it was necessary to make tests. We did a varnish removal test with ethanol, acetone and 3 to 5% cellulose ether in acetone, which removes varnish more successfully than these two before. And in addition to acetone and dissolving gel, uh, we used scalpel and sponge to speed up the cleaning. Uh, since the upper structure is composed of two pieces of wood, uh, due to inadequate conditions, it's split and bent, and it uh, was necessary to straighten and strengthen the structure. Uh, paper layer, uh, we firstly uh, isolated paper layer with cyclododecan and uh, polyvinyl acetate glue was injected into, into the crack. Uh, then the two component epoxy putty was put into the wider parts of crack. 
So due to the problems that occurred, the previous interventions had to be removed. Uh, the structure was corrected again and a handmade putty made of PVA glue and medium grain, grain sawdust uh, was used and the part of the crack that is under the paper was experimentally glued with construction glue and uh, it shows very good adhesion and cohesion properties. So this took the most time of my work on the table. Uh, so uh, since the veneers were falling off and they were missing uh, veneers, we used 40% gl uh, bone glue with addition of leather glue to glue them back again on the table. We, uh, glue was applied with brush or injected in order to inject it beneath them. Uh, some veneers had to be completely removed from the table because the original glue was brittle. And <clears throat> uh, in this case, due to minor damage from insects, the consolidation was done partially. Uh, thermoplastic resin, uh, in this case, paraloid B72, uh, in acetone was used as a consolidant. The consolidant is injected through the holes caused by the woodworms. And first we used the 10% solution, then a 30% solution. Uh, so we had to make new pieces of uh, veneers and uh, they were glued on top of each other to get the desired thickness because the original veneers were very thick and they don't uh, make uh, new ones like that. Uh, they were glued with 40% uh, bone glue and to, in order to obtain the desired wood tone, 10% uh, synthetic stain CLT7 uh, dissolved in ethanol and shellac ruby were used. And here are some pictures of uh, reconstruction of missing parts. And as an imitation of the dark veneers, uh, it was used the walnut veneer that had been pre previously or subsequently stained. So we made some staining and saturation tests. First, tannin dissolved in ethanol with water. It showed satisfactory results uh, of color and everything, but it doesn't uh, penetrate deep enough into the wood. Uh, natural darkening of wood with apple cider vinegar tannin and rust, you, you have to soak in the veneer or put several layers, but it didn't also penetrate enough. Uh, and the uh, last is uh, Schminke Horda Macquarell, also only surface layer, but a very satisfactory color. And we use the uh, layer of a 5% thermoplastic resin as a fixing layer. So restoration of the paper layer, firstly, we need to, needed to determine the quality of paper, that is uh, whether the paper was made out of uh, pure cellulose or contains lignin. Uh, Herzberg's reagents was used for fiber analysis. It is a chemical that gives uh, different coloring in contact with uh, different types of fibers. In this case, uh, Fibers of both paper layer gave purple color, coloring, which confirmed that papers were made out of pure cell, cellulose. Uh, for cleaning the paper layers, we first started with dry cleaning. Uh, so we started by dusting with the brush, then vacuuming. Uh, after that, uh, we done tests with an eraser and wish up sponge and eraser show uh, best remove surface dirt. And since the eraser, uh, <clears throat> since the eraser can't remove water and thin stains, uh, so solvent cleaning tests were done. It turned out that distilled water is the best for removing impurities and it doesn't do any harm to the paper. Uh, 
And for the end, uh, we did the restoration of metal parts. Uh, locks were removed from the drawers due to complete corrosion and the possibility of further corrosion spreading to paper and wood. Uh, corrosion was removed by using micromotor and sand blasting. The mechanisms were later protected with tannin and 3.5 solution of thermoplastic resin in acetone. So, and for conclusion, I would uh, ask these two questions, because the Summer Villa Skocibuha is a prominent cultural monument in the very center of the city of Dubrovnik and has been in poor condition for many years. Uh, the fact that uh, it houses the valuable collection of the Dubrovnik Science Library didn't help in the renovation. And years of carelessness and unresolved uh, legal property relations prevent the issue to be resolved. Uh, with its arrangement, the University of Dubrovnik successfully contribute, contributes to preserving the memory and importance of Skocibuha Summer Villa and its inventory. In two years of dedicated work, the dressing table was restored, unfortunately not completely because we faced some problems and respecting the principles of distinctiveness while preserving the originality and its historical significance. Uh, this is the literature used. And thank you. Thank you, Yoshipa. This was a very nice contribution and what an effort you took to do the restoration of this table. Uh, let's proceed to the next contribution. We will have a try again with Mario Volta. Um, Mario, could you test whether your microphone is now? now Hello, can now. you hear me? Yes, now it's, it's working. So, um, yeah, next up is Mario Sebastian Volta. And he is a student of Cologne. Mario is a student of the fourth BA semester, and he currently works on a chest made of different materials, like uh, Sophie already said. Mario will now provide some answers what uh, he did in cleaning and sorting fragments. Um, and let's go on. Please go ahead, Mario. Thank you very much. Um, a very warm welcome to you all. I'm Mario Bolzer, and I'm in my fourth semester of studying restoration and conservation of art and cultural objects made of wood and modern materials at the Cologne Institute for Conservation Science at TH Köln, University of Applied Sciences. I was given the task of restoring a flood damaged trunk from Bad Neuner Ahrweiler. My lecture today will be about a part of the still unfinished complex of measures, the cleaning and consolidation of the interior paper lining. The object in mention comes from the town museum of Bad Neuner Ahrweiler. The small town in northern Rhineland is historically very strongly influenced by wine growing and is still home to the largest winemaking community in the R region. Its magnificent and elaborately restored timber framed houses and well preserved medieval town wall, as well as its world famous springs, make, make Bad Neuner a very popular vacation site for visitors. The town has a long history. It was first mentioned in writing as early as 1893 by Archaeological remains from the Hallstatt and Roman periods prove a much earlier origin. In the summer of 2021, heavy rainfall in Western and Central Europe caused severe flash floods and flooding in several river regions. The district of Ahrweiler was hit especially hard, where the flooding of the Ahr River left a trail of destruction. In Bad Neuner Ahrweiler alone, 69 people died of the total of over 220 victims claimed by the disaster. 
During the night of the 14th to 15th July, the underground depot of the city museum with its artifacts from the city's history, such as paintings, graphics and sculptures, furniture and archaeological findings, was flooded. Almost the entire collection since 1906 belonging to the city of Bad Neuner Ahrweiler has been housed in that underground car park. Most of the total of over 2,800 objects suffered serious damage. An estimated 30% are considered to have been irretrievably destroyed. The amount of loss from privately owned cultural objects can hardly be quantified. On the right picture, you can see the recovery of objects from the deep depository, which could only be pumped free after more than two weeks. The restoration of what could be rescued is very important for the identity of the people and an essential contribution to the future of the region. This leather covered trunk made of fir and oak wood, which is studded with metal fittings and lined with printed paper inside the body. Under the paper, in the lid, you can still find the original linen covering. The chest was exposed to mud and water for over two weeks. Later, after salvage, it dried in an uncontrolled manner. It is likely that this caused the most damage to the substance. To take it short, the predominant part of the damage is shrinkage and deterioration of leather, wood and paper, and still a si significant amount of adhering dirt. The primary tasks are the removal of the adhering mud and consolidation of loose components. The close bond between the different materials is a major challenge for restoration. Each has suffered characteristic damage and requires specific handling. If you already find these images intimidating, be prepared for the next one. The, the trying induced shrinking and bulging of the adhering thick layer of mud has torn the paper at the inner corpus front wall into many small fragments. These mostly adhered more to the mud clots than to the wood. The ma majority of the clots were loose and could be picked off very easily. Some had already fallen off as a result of previous transportation. The top priority of further measures, therefore, had to be the transfer of the fragments into an organizing system. For this purpose, I created a map on which the removal, uh, removed clots could be assigned and arranged. Some of the clots could already be sorted out because there was no paper attached to them. Even if it seems positive at first that a not inconsiderable part remained in situ on the object, it should be noted that many of that paper fragments only attached to a few spots. The inclined position of the object enabled more convenient accessibility and prevented loose fragments from falling. The depositing map behind my back allowed easy attribution of the clots by simple rotation on the stool. The main purpose of hanging the lid was to take tension of the joints. Once all the clots were assigned, it was now up to find a way to detach the paper from them or remove the sludge from the paper as you like. The examination of the mud clots revealed that they consisted of sedimented silty marl or alluvolite. This contains, among other ingredients, sand, quartzite, siltstone and slate, of which there are rich deposits in the R Valley, as well as calcite, feldspar, mica, clay, gypsum and iron oxide. The upper layer with grain sites well below 0.02 millimeter has formed a cohesive, very dense grid structure. Towards the bottom, however, the size of the particles increases. The layer directly on the paper is composed of angular and round grains with cavities. This made it very porous. 
which enables mechanical cleaning. Previous attempts to dissolve the sediment sludge with water were unsuccessful. Even the use of an ultrasonic bath did little to dissolve the clots, and the process was aborted because the paper was also defibrillated. Because mechanical cleaning strains the fragile paper and breaking the clots can tear it, the paper had to be reinforced. I divided the clots on the map into sections and grouped the fragments into convolutes. Then I added the cellulose eater to the G to, to back uh, off the paper, a polymeric binder I dissolved in ethanol to prevent the less vicious shorter chain binder crucial E from bleeding through the surface. I didn't want to consolidate the dirt, dirt any further. I used the crucial E to attach Japanese paper to the underside of the fragment. After that, I put the strange slots into the freezer to make the mud more brittle. Crucial is a binder that is soluble in both water and alcohol, and it's also used in paper restoration to make the deteriorated paper more resilient. Another advantage is that it's almost invisible and very resistant to aging. The curved shape of the clots meant that no pressure could be applied when placed on a flat surface without breaking it. Even the Japanese paper could not prevent the paper from tearing in this case. What was needed instead was a supple base that offered consistent resistance, but was neither too soft nor too hard. The solution involved two sponges wrapped with adhesive film, whose interspace was bent with a soft lever. On top of this lies Tyvek fabric. The design made it possible to regulate the spring hardness, respectively the resistance to the compression of the sponges. This enabled the cleaning pad to be adapted precisely to the requirements. The stabilized and frozen clot could now be burst from the paper surface using a scalpel, starting from the outer edge. For this purpose, the dense upper sediment layer was at first removed with a sideways guided date. Measurements showed that the pressure required for removal could be reduced by more than half by removing the upper millimeter. After that, the mud could be gradually blasted off with vertical piercing. By, by using only the thrust of the scalpel tip and working carefully, the plate did not come into contact with the paper surface. The pictures show how a paper fragment is gradually freed from mud using the technique described. In order to have a clear view of the working section, loose chunks had to be removed repeatedly with a brush. Although this process took only a few minutes, it meant a lot of time and effort if applied to hundreds of clots. The last two pictures in the series show that there was still a lot of dirt left on the surface. This is how the paper surface looked before and after secondary mechanical cleaning on the microscope, which was done with a brush and, if necessary, carefully, carefully with a soft, dry cleaning sponge. To be honest, mechanical cleaning cannot be done in a non-destructive manner. On the right picture, you can see, among still adhering part particles, some defects in the paint layer. However, those are so tiny that they are not visible to the naked eye. It is important to determine the right time to stop cleaning. To replant the fragments, I cut them out from Japanese paper. I left a little overhang on some of them to push the edges under the adjoining paper. As adhesive, I use Clusil again. Since this is a very weak binder, it's needed to uh, it needed a dust-free ground. First, the undersides of the partly still loose paper that remained in the chest had to be freed from dirt to be finally attached. It helped to insert Japanese paper under some of them for better adhesion. The assignment of the paper fragments 
turned out to be more difficult than expected because the shapes of the fragments were not congruent with those of the clots. There were often several smaller fragments adhering under a single one. The numbering of the clots on the map was not enough to assign the fragments correctly. A challenging puzzle game began. An important orientation was given by the reconstruction of the pa paper pattern, which was properly that of a very fancy wallpaper. It still seems to be quite damaged, but it's um, in consideration of the previous condition, it can be seen as a success successful result. The remaining clots were either there before or have been caused by the loss of clots during transport. On the basis of this comparison, it is possible to measure what part of the total area was removed, cleaned, and returned. In total, the, pre the presented measures required well over 100 hours. While carrying out the rather time consuming measures, I managed to simplify or accelerate some of the proceedings by making var various improvements. A lot of time was saved by attaching a brush to the end of the scalpel handle. This meant that the knife no longer had to be put down to pick up the brush during the mechanical cleaning. I also found that consolidation with Japanese paper was more successful if it was cut into stripes and soaked in glue. This made it much more pliable and further pressing was no longer necessary. When returning the paper fragments, it proved very practical to use weighted sandbags for pressing instead of pushing them down by hand. After the paper lining has been consolidated, further cleaning can now be carried out with fine placing apparatus. This should also allow cleaning of the remaining paper. The mechanical cleaning with a scalpel does not work without damaging, damaging the paint layer. The dirt layer is equivalent to the much denser upper layers of the sediment structure depicted before. Further upcoming tasks are, are the cleaning of the corroded metal parts and the wood. My previous speaker has already presented a method by that the last one could be done. For the treatment of the delicate leather covering, the object will probably hand it over to a storer specialized in this field. Thank you for following the re report of my journey, which will be continued quite a while. Thank you a lot, Mario. A very nice talk, and I think there will be some um, questions. And now we have time for questions. And um, the questions are for the last four speakers, and so I uh, ask uh, Katja, Yoshipa, Mario um, to unmute their microphones so that we can put the questions. The first goes to Katja, and it's a question of Margaret Geis Mooney. Um, before you put on your breathing protection, is there an obvious order to the wall scones uh, before treatment. So and the question is uh, whether there is an obvious order. Um, no, not really, uh, as it's all dried now. Um, but during the cleaning um, with the water, uh, you can actually um, uh, Yes, uh, smell uh, the, uh, the, the cotton swabs I used. And yes, it's uh, quite unpleasant. <laughs> but uh, the dried object doesn't smell anymore. OK. If I got it right, it's the only question to Katja. And the next goes to Yoshipa. Sophie, you will take over. Yes, I will. Um, I have um, one question for Emmeline. I think we'll do her next. Um, ah, sorry. 
yeah, no, that's that's okay. Um, from uh, Antje Zigalski. Uh, this is a quite an interesting project. Um, oh, it's more of a comment, I have to say. Maybe you could have a follow up with the results on Connects 2024. We would encourage it. Sorry, just give me a little moment. But apologies for that. But yes, I would love to uh, participate in uh, next year's uh, Connects and present the uh, results uh, then, because as I said, the research is still ongoing and I have to resume it, but I would love to. Well, that's that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, and I think there's another question coming in. Uh, when do you think it will be concluded? That's a bit hard to say as of right now, because uh, to keep it professional, uh, a lot of I have to take uh, a lot of uh, I have to take care of a lot of matters as of right now. Uh, that keeps me very busy, so I can't give an exact estimation as to when I'll be getting my conclusions. As of right now, that's that's too. Um, um, what's the right word? It's it's hard to predict as of right now, but I do hope. Um, next uh, year spring that I do have my uh, conclusions by then. Okay, thank you, uh, Emmeline. Um, Andreas, do you want to do the uh, questions for Mario? Or Josipa is next, I'm sorry. Yeah, go on with Josipa. Josipa, um, I think uh, Andreas has to leave the building because it closes at 10. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, do you want me to take, I can do the rest of the questions and then. Uh... Okay, okay, do so. Yeah? Sorry you for that. You don't have to rush out. No, no worries, no worries. <laughs> okay, um, next question for you, Shipa. Um, another question from Antje, thank you for your contribution. Uh, why have you used tannins to protect the metal elements? And thanks for mentioning the use of glycerin for preparing microscopic samples. Uh, so tannin is used to uh, is an has an antioxidation properties and it's used to prevent the further corrosion of the metal. And that's basically it. Yeah, that's that's a very clear answer. Thank you. And another um, answer from another question from Katja Shula. Uh, I may have missed this part, but is there even more furniture, a whole collection of furniture of this villa in such a condition? Uh, yes, there are. And there is a secretary and the commode, which are currently at the university. And commode ha was even badly damaged by Sharpenel from the war. And it will be a challenge to restore it. It has a big holes in it. And is it ever considered to not restore it because of its historical uh, context? Uh, we don't know that yet because uh, there are a lot of uh, other furniture to be restored, so it waits. Yes, I can imagine there's a there's a lot. Um, okay, thank you, Yoshipa, for your contribution. Um, and we'll go to the next questions from Mario. Um, uh, another question for Antje. Uh, Mario, can you re please recall the layout of the cleaning pad you mentioned? Um, do you mean um, sh show it again or explain it? Uh, well, if you want to show it again, if that will if that will cl clarify your explanation, that's that's uh, also okay. Um, um. I'm very uh, would be very pleased if an uh, administrator could um, load my presentation files again and yeah, skip you... on the eleventh slide. Oh yeah, that's 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 perfect information. I will put it off. This one, yeah. Um, also, okay, I explain it again. Also, first I uh, put two sponges which I um, packed in adhesive um, film um, where I can control 
the the um, um, the resistance, the the spring hardness of the sponge by um, uh, how um, um, how um, yeah, how should I say um, by how how dense I um, comprim uh, compress the compress the sponge, and then I um, uh, there um, uh, another layer of it, um, adhesive film um, and um, um, some soft leather um, um, bridge the, the the gap between the sponges, so it uh, create a mold where I can work with the um, bulk um, um, about um, clots. It's very supple to the clots. Um, is, um, is that an uh, answer to your question? Um, yeah, thank you, Mario. And you, does this answer, answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you, Mario. Um, then the final question of uh, this evening uh, from Paul Quinton. Uh, did you use Cluso E or E or G to as well to uh, refix the paper onto the wood? Uh, yes, of course, because um, it worked um, pretty well, and actually I um, didn't want to insert uh, another uh, binder, um, but um, you have um, to um, carefully as well consider. Um, that uh, measure because um, it's uh, soluble in water and uh, you you it's um, yeah if if you clean with water then it's uh, it comes in contact with water it easily uh, lose the adhering the, uh, attaching to the the wood and uh, fall off so so that um, but uh, the, about in, um, in this uh, try uh, condition, it's a very, in a very strong uh, connection to the to the wooden support. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Paul also says, "Okay, thanks." So uh, thank you very much, Mario. Uh, I think these are uh, all the questions for this evening. If you have any more questions. Uh, Put them in the chat or email us and, and we'll uh, make sure that um, they'll be forwarded. Uh, so let me put on the right slide. This will this brings us to the end of the first very first session of Connext uh, 2023. Uh, I would like to thank firstly our keynote spe speakers, Mr. Bushinaki and uh, Maria Borisenko for being with us tonight and hopefully uh, Mrs. Hofrat and Mrs. Thiel um, get a chance another evening uh, to uh, do their keynote presentation that we uh, look forward to very much, but unfortunately um, we will have to postpone those. And a big thank you to all the student speakers of today. Uh, Katja Schüller, Mario Sebastian Wolter, Emmeline Verheij and Yoshipa Fodopia. And um, also on behalf of uh, Andreas, uh, who had to leave early, we would like to thank you and our institutes uh, and partners at Connects. And of course, mostly you, the audience, for making this happen. We hope you had a good time. Um, even we had quite a serious subject this evening um, with disaster recovery. Uh, the next Connects session is called Understanding and Treating Wooden Supports. Uh, our keynote speaker will be Shane Wichnick. Um, he's an American that studied in at Westin College and now lives and works in Australia. And he did a year long journeymanship uh, that we he will um, talk about next year, uh, next week at the same time uh, as, as today. And it, the session will be hosted by Shane Rivers and Angelica Rauch. Um, well, see you all next Tuesday, uh, same time, same place. Uh, just use the next link in the overview you received and uh, hope to see you again uh, next week. Bye-bye.